Hello. I am going to make a video today about when you're in recovery and on paper, it seems like you're doing really, really good. And you probably are you're making progress. Mental shifts are starting to happen in the right direction. You're challenging things. You're being intentional with how you're doing things. But perhaps there's things you could challenge even more. And it's like, huh? And that's where coaching sometimes comes in handy because I was just speaking with a client and honestly, just like a, a dream client, right? They're taking action. This is my first session with her and she's taking action and she's doing and applying the things that I talk about in videos. And she's two weeks in and she's feeling like the mental shifts that I've talked about myself when I was in recovery. I was like, after like a week, I felt like, hey, I actually think things are changing and she's experiencing that. And I kind of was asking more specific questions and she was kind of going through, okay, you know, so cereal scared me. So I started eating cereal and now I'm eating like cereal with a bowl of yogurt and I let her kind of continue on throughout the day. And then I kind of returned back to, how come you're having yogurt with your bowl of cereal, right? That's not like a bad thing to do, right? People that aren't in recovery, yogurt with a bowl of cereal and some fruit, great, sounds delicious, good breakfast, right? But as a coach, I also know there's sometimes some meaning behind that without even the person who's in recovery noticing why it is they're doing that. It's probably the answer would be because I like it. It's a good, just a good combination. I don't know, I prefer it that way. It's just a nice like mix of, I don't know, crunchy and then like smooth and cold. And then I asked that question like, would having multiple bowls of cereal and no bowl of yogurt be more challenging? And she said, yes. And she kind of got an anxious look on her face, yes maybe you should challenge that, right? And so there's these stepping stones sometimes into unrestricted eating. When people ask like, I don't even know how to start. It's like, actually you do start with identifying something scares you. Cereal scares me. Okay, I'm gonna have cereal. And then without you even trying, somehow your eating disorder will sneak in there and do some disordered thing that you don't even realize disordered. And then if you have a loved one that you live with that knows eating disordered, what, eating disorders well, or you have a coach who's asking the right questions, they can kind of get to the bottom of that and be like, okay, you've got to challenge more. You've got to do the scariest thing. So when you're on your own, and if you don't have a coach or you don't live with someone who's going to perhaps call you out or you just don't really want anyone in your business and you're doing this all on your own, which is great, then you ask yourself, okay, I'm having cereal with my bowl of yogurt. This is recovery. Like I would have never had cold cereal. I love that I can have this bowl. This is like so exciting and new and different and I'm going to rewire. And I want you to ask yourself, what could I do that would be even more challenging than this? And ask yourself that like every day. What could I do that's more challenging than this? Every time you eat, what's something I could do that'd be more challenging than this challenge? And this person also was talking about how they still feel like in prior to the two weeks, they had been kind of in like a state of quasi recovery where they were doing better. They had done some rehabilitating, but just didn't quite get the whole like mental progress that they were hoping for and still feeling kind of stuck and kind of thinking about food more than they wanted, sort of obsessing. Food is still on a pedestal, even dreaming about food, fears about things happening with food in their in their sleep and things like that. And, and when someone's telling me that, I'm like, there's still restriction going on, despite what they may believe there is. And so then the digging and the asking and the inquiring, um, investigating, interrogating, if you want to call it that, will usually kind of bring to the surface things that they weren't aware of. And so where you may not have that person, you may have to be the person who's doing that for yourself and you have to be very honest with yourself and then very accountable and follow through with what is it that would actually be scarier than the challenge. Some other examples could be like pizza. You know, clients will tell me, <laughs> I mean, I'm making it sound like I'm just like clients tell me their wins and I'm like, it's not a win, it's still the eating disorder. I try not to do that in that way. I try to help them self-discover on their own. Was there any part of that, you know, that you think your eating disorder maybe had a part in? So let's say someone's like, I'm having, I'm having pizza now. Like I can eat pizza with my family on the weekends. Blah, blah, blah. Do you have to eat anything with pizza? What do you mean? Like, do you have salad or do you have to have like a veggie tray or, well, yeah, we usually, I usually have like a salad with it. I'm like, what if you didn't have the salad? What if you didn't have the salad with the pizza and you just had more pizza? Oh, and the first thought usually is probably like, well, then I just want to eat more pizza, Ugh, right? Well, there's your answer. So then we've got to choose the harder thing. Um, I say this too often, two things can be true at the same time in regards to making choices about what to eat. 
So it could be true that you really prefer a certain food. You really, really love fresh food. And also your eating disorder really loves fresh food, especially, especially in place of things that might not be quite so quote unquote fresh, if you want to call it that. Okay. So because both of those things are true, I'm not going to argue with someone and be like, you don't really like fresh food. Actually, you're lying. You don't like fruits and vegetables. I'm sure they probably do. I don't doubt that. Those are good. But if your eating disorder also is loving that, then we have to ignore the preference, unfortunately, for the time being and challenge the thing that's harder. Okay. So what that might look like is like, no, what I really love, what I really, really do honestly like Becky is mm, a fresh deli sandwich. I like whole wheat bread. I go to this one deli and they just make it so good. And I like like thin sliced cheese on it and all these whatever fixings and, and toppings. I really like it thick with all these, the produce and veggies in it. And I just really prefer that. It's like, what if at that sandwich shop, you got a grilled cheese on white bread? I honestly don't prefer that, Becky. I really don't. Like, fair enough. But which does your eating disorder like more? Probably the fresh deli sandwich with all the vegetables on it, right? And so you have to, you have to then make the choice that's going to feel much harder, much scarier, and probably annoying because you really just want the thing you want. But I'm going to ask you to actually just have the grilled cheese just in the name of recovery, just because you have to rewire your brain. Just do the harder thing. Do the thing that you actually think you don't even feel like having. Um, and by doing that, your brain really will, it really will rewire. It really will take food off of a pedestal. Another thing that I'm going to suggest in this video before I end is oftentimes we get Depending on when you have your eating disorder, this may or may not be applicable to you, depending on when you develop it. Some people develop it as early as nine, some of my clients, and they're in their 60s, 70s, right? So perhaps they have no memory of what their preferences were when they were a kid. Um, and this can work both ways where someone will say, oh, I never liked those foods as a kid, so I don't like them now as an adult, so I don't even have to challenge them. Or I loved those foods as a kid, but now I'm an adult, and so I probably won't like them, right? And so... For me, when I was a kid, I actually didn't really like pasta very much. I didn't like tortillas and I didn't really love cheese. I know, weird kid. As an adult, guess what I loved that I could say? I don't like, like I never, as a kid, mom, I never even ate spaghetti. I don't like tortillas. I don't eat burritos. I don't like tacos. I don't like cheese on anything. I just don't like cheese, right? It's easy for me before recovery to just say those things and live for 20 years in that lie. But when I really went into recovery, I was like, okay, I've got to readdress some of these things. I have to try these things again and see if I actually really hate them. And turns out I actually like all those things. And I can't even believe as a kid I didn't. And that was pre-eating disorder as a kid. I didn't like those things. I don't know. Maybe it was a texture thing or I was a crazy kid. But now as an adult, I really do like those things. So please don't be quick, too quick to assume I don't have to try X, Y, and Z in recovery because I already know I don't like it. Be very open-minded and I would encourage you to try everything unless it causes a legit like allergic reaction and you already know that or it's like you're actually dry heaving, but don't be dramatic about that. Don't be like, oh, I'm gonna throw up. Like actually really just, just try it because it's amazing what we can convince our minds when we're disordered to believe, okay? And I know a lot of you listening can agree with that. Like it's incredible what you can tell yourself that you don't like and truly put in your mouth and be like, see, I don't like it. A lot of that's to do with the anxiety going on. And a lot of that is just years of not having it and needing to get used to eating that thing again. So this video is a little bit all over the place, but you need to be your own detective when it comes to looking out for any eating disorder behaviors. You're responsible for your own recovery. As a coach, do I help to bring that to the surface and then encourage and empower you to then change it? Yes. But if you don't have that, you have to be very on top of things. And if you are working with me or you have another coach, don't wait around for the coach to ask the right questions. I try to be pretty good about making sure I'm catching those things, but also too, some information might be withheld for me. And so at the end of the day, you do have to be completely responsible um, to get really good at, develop that skill of being, oh my gosh, I have to ask that question. Becky said, I have to ask is, how could I make this harder? What would be a harder scenario, even though this already feels really hard and then do that thing. So. That's my video again, almost 10 minutes. I feel like I'm, am I losing my touch guys? Am I losing my ability to talk very precisely and short? I'll try to get it together and make them a little bit more articulate, but I just, I guess my thoughts aren't very organized. And I feel like as my kids, 
are getting older. So I have two ninth graders and a seventh grader. And I just feel like my world's been like flipped upside down with those ages and the hormones going on and the homework that they're having now in these grades. Um, it's a lot. So if sometimes I'm going in circles, it just takes me a second to organize my thoughts and I don't have time to write out what I'm going to say before a video. So you get, you get what, whatever comes out of my mouth. So, okay. Have a good day. Bye.